Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to join us live for a session sometime, you can join our weekly Control the Room Facilitation Lab. It's a free event to meet fellow facilitators and explore new techniques so you can apply the things you learn in the podcast in real time with other facilitators. Sign up today at voltagecontrol.com slash facilitation dash lab. If you'd like to learn more about my new book, Magical Meetings, you can download the Magical Meetings Quick Start Guide, a free PDF reference with some of the most important pieces of advice from the book. Download a copy today at voltagecontrol.com slash magical dash meetings dash quick dash guide. Today, I'm with Rodney Evans at the Ready, where she is pioneering the discovery of new ways to approach the future of work. She's also the co-host of the podcast, Brave New Work. Welcome to the show, Rodney. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. So great to have you. So let's start off by hearing a little bit about how you started. How did you get into the work of the future of the work? Yeah, <laughs> um, like backwards and by falling. Um, yeah, I I feel like a lot of the choices that I've made in my life and certainly the ones that led to this were in a rebellion against something I didn't like rather than a conscious choice about something I did like. And so I worked in really traditional organizations for the first 10 years of my career, and I was deeply unhappy and also like a the worst version of myself as a person, just, you know, like walking rage filled ego all day, every day. And I, I got like pretty burnt out by the time I was in my 30s and had no real conception at all that there were people trying to reinvent what work really looked like. But in my sort of rage quitting of my job in New York City and travel and then subsequent travel around the world and a lot of self-discovery and getting married and doing a bunch of other things and leaving New York City, I found my way very randomly into this sort of corpus of work around, you know, I'll loosely call it self-management. And what that looked like really was that I had a, a very good friend who was working at the McChrystal Group. This was before Team of Teams and asked me if I would do some consulting work with them, you know, when they were teeny, teeny, tiny. And that led to a few years of really like swimming around in the pond of future of work theory and looking at um, you know, the the greatest hits like organizing for complexity and reinventing orgs and things like that. And then a lot of um, lesser known and adjacent disciplines like social science, behavioral economics. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time reading about the morality of tribes and things like that. And just like I just sort of swam around in all of this stuff while I helped try to grow this business and create, you know, synthesis of research that ultimately ended up in the book team of teams. And 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 then from there, you know, I like had the bug and there was really no going back to something that didn't look like it was discovering or a part of the unfolding of the future of work. Well, having that experience, it would be hard to like unlearn that, right? Yeah, you could go exactly. back to the way that things were. <laughs> exactly. It's I mean, it's impossible. It's impossible. I, to me. And, and and I suppose, you know, it's privileged to be able to say that. But I truly, you know, there are a lot of things that I would have done post McChrystal Group before I would have gone back to a traditional hierarchical organization. Mm. So many questions. I want to get into what is the power of even experiencing that and how much impact that could have on organizations, just being able to witness it firsthand, because I think that's so many people are starved of that. And when you say witness it, tell me a little bit more. The self-managing, you know, the, the power mm. of what, what it means to be part of an organization that's behaving in these ways. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting question because I think that in some ways self-management feels like, oh, it's just work. And like we're working in teams and we have a lot of autonomy and how different is it really? And then in other ways, it's so radically different to work in a self-managing company that it is 
like it it completely upends your view of systems generally and and I don't totally know how to I wish that more people could have the experience even while they're working in their more traditional jobs so that they sort of understood that there was another way of being and organizing and collaborating and deciding that works in fact better than all of the ways that they've been taught and socialized to and rewarded for their whole lives. But like, that's just not, that's not how the vast, vast majority of the world experiences work. So it's a strange thing to feel like you're sort of on the other side of something and, and hoping that more and more people are able to cross over that chasm. Yeah, it's like fascinating because it's hard to run experiments because there's no control, right? Like you, you go to work every day and you experience work the way you're going to experience it. But then how do you, how do you see what the alternative could be without actually going to the alternative? And that's risky for folks. It can be very scary to think that, wait, I'm, I'm expected to go change all this stuff. And, but this is kind of somewhat working. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a thing once, once you're in, a fully self-managed system and and sort of the, the ready, certainly I consider to be an organization that is experimenting a lot with new ways of working and thinking. And, you know, we do stuff in our company that most of our clients would never try doing. And I'm happy to talk about that stuff. But because, you know, <laughs> the, the irony <laughs> or the reality of being at the edge of the future of work is that you don't have tons and tons and tons of examples to look to. And so certainly, you know, we draw tons of inspiration from the Favis, the Birdsorgs, the Hires, you know, the the case studies that everybody knows about. And at the same time, when you think about the operating system of a company, there's tons of stuff that isn't figured out. Like, I want to have I want to have 10 versions of beyond budgeting to choose from, not one. I want to have 10 versions of, you know, holocratic meetings, not one. As we're just we're like making it up. <laughs> as we yeah. as we go along and trying to figure out how to expand and extend the practice so that it can become more accessible, more attainable for people to be trying stuff inside of their context, even if they don't work in a self-managing system. You know, the fascinating thing about all of this is that it's all rooted in complexity theory. Yes. Which tells you that you don't take a simple solution because we're dealing with a complex system, yet Everyone wants to import best practices from other companies. Right. That is what they want. They, they just yearn for it. They want to just pick up the business book and get the anecdote, listen to the podcast, get the thing, and go just say, we're going to put this in and it's going to fix everything. And so to your point, there, there can't be one way to do the thing. It's got to be 10. It's got to be hundreds. Exactly. So that we can kind of pick and choose little pieces and then experiment. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I want there to be so much inspiration for experimentation out there so that people can use it as fodder, not as a prescription. That's so good. So what what are some of these things that y'all are experimenting with that your clients would never do? <laughs> well, I mean, the the thing that's on my mind right now uh there's a lot of stuff we could talk about. The thing that's on my mind right now because I have a big role in helping shape it is around compensation. So the Ready has always had transparent compensation. We have, for the last bunch of years, had self-set pay, which means every member determines what the pay is for the role, for each of the roles that they're holding, and they go through an advice process. But ultimately, the final authority is theirs to determine what their compensation is. And like a lot of things at the Ready, we, we've sort of like, I would say, diverge and had some looseness and some lack of constraint around that over the over a couple of years. And now it feels like we know enough for some convergence. And what I mean by that isn't like constraining or controlling or regulating or saying, you know, you can't or do it this way. But it's more like now that we have a bunch of reps and we have 30 humans who have like just lived in this soup for a while, what is the scaffolding that would make it easier, more inclusive, lighter lift, et cetera. And so what I'm playing with right now is creating a model like based on the Shuhari mastery model that is a, a Japanese martial arts model of mastery and sort of saying, okay, this is roughly how you can think about your your own mastery in a in a three-leveled way, not in a performance management way, not in like a competency model way. Let's not be gross, but in a loose way and 
trying to get to a fixed rate for each of those levels of mastery so that you eliminate like variety where it doesn't really serve a purpose or where it's not necessary. Because what we've realized from all of us having this much agency over this for this long is now what people are seeking is not more freedom, it's more clarity. And so there's more of a drumbeat in the system now that's like, we don't necessarily understand why there are differences between these rates. We're not sure that there's a good reason. So now we're actually hungry for a little bit more constraint and consistency. But that only comes because it was like wide open for a long time. So that's one example. Yeah, that's fascinating. It even makes me start thinking about like when you talked about the clarity, it's like even companies struggle with banding Mm -hmm. when it comes to like you look at the language used in a design organization versus language used in an engineering organization. You know, principle means different things. <laughs> like, right. Right. And so sometimes the titles are have to do with like, are we managing people or are we like going toward a, a, a different kind of track? And so so many of these layers get so complicated that I don't even think everyone truly understands what's happening. Exactly. And to your earlier point about complexity, most of those kinds of models and titles and bands and blah, blah, blah are complicated solutions that don't serve well in complexity. And so like my job as an org designer is to say, what is the lightest, most elegant, most intuitive solution that that equips us to navigate complexity rather than what is like a complicated and overwrought and over-engineered solution that doesn't actually do anything to cut through complexity. It's just an exercise that we have to go through, which is what I think a lot of like spans and layers and compensation analysis ends up looking like is 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 the more complicated thing. Yeah. So let's, for our listeners that aren't as seeped in complexity, help them understand the difference between complicated and complex. Because that's always a fascinating, like dipping your toe into the water of complexity. Like understanding that is like a, I think a first fun step. Okay, cool. And yeah, just, you know, feel free to, to, to pile on here. So the the difference between complication and complexity, complicated systems are closed systems that have interdependent parts but can be understood. And easy mental model for that is like a watch, an engine, something that an expert could fix. So when we talk about complicated, it doesn't matter how many parts it has that are interacting with each other. The truth is you're not going to open the hood of your car and have a clown pop out. That's complexity. So complex systems are not closed systems. Think about the weather. Think about traffic. Think about a bunch of human beings in a crowd. We can understand dispositionally what might be happening. Like it might, you know, there might be more traffic on the highway at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. But what we can't predict is if you add four more cars and two accidents and two speed traps, how much or little will it slow down? So in complexity, Rather than trying to predict and control, we have to do more simple moves like if it's a Friday afternoon, maybe I'll leave myself an extra 20 minutes versus I'm going to be able to somehow model or best practice or command and control or plan my way through this. We can plan our way through complicated systems. We cannot plan our way through complexity. You know, I think that a great example is let's just add another lane to this highway. It's going to solve this traffic problem. Right. right. So have you ever heard the um, jumbo jet is complicated and mayonnaise is complex? No. Tell that's, me. That's a fun one. So a jumbo jet, you can put it in a hangar and come back a year later and it'll be just like you left it. You could hire an expert. They could take it completely apart and put it back together. It might be a very arduous task, but they could do it. A mayonnaise is not going to be the same in a week if you leave it sitting on your counter Also, you can't unmake a mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the it's the the not predicted interaction of the environment and the components. Yes. Yes. That totally makes sense. That's cool. And and because it's I think it gets people's attention, too, because they're like, wait a second. Like that mayonnaise (laughs) seems way more simple than a jumbo jet. (laughs) Right. Right. But when will it spoil? How much oxygen does it need? Does light impact it? What about the seal on the jar? It's like you can't know with high fidelity exactly what's going to happen. That's you right. have an idea that year old mayonnaise is not going to be amazing. But <laughs> That's right. 
So I guess I'm really curious about some of this formative stuff at Team of Teams and the McChrystal Group. It's really fascinating to me. Can you recount any moments that were kind of key, just like that have always stuck with you as far as learning some of this stuff or just being exposed to the inner workings of these systems? Um, yeah. I mean, gosh, there were so many. I was I was incredibly fortunate to have a team of people who were ba- you know, our our mission was basically like figure out what adaptive systems and adaptive humans really means. And like what better and more interesting, I mean, to me, remit to have for a couple of years to just go spelunking into the world and try to like figure something out that at the time, not so, so many people were writing about in the popular consciousness. So there were a lot of moments. I, I think probably the the body of work that I was most inspired by and taken with, which at the time was not very well known at all, was Sandy Pentland's work, which is a you know social science that talks about performance as being about number of interactions, things like shared airtime. A lot of that work ultimately became part of Google's Project Aristotle, but this was way before then. And when I got turned on to that work, and started really understanding more about social science and more about how it correlates to team performance and it and that it wasn't any of the things that I thought it was that like kind of broke my brain. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's funny to me that it always comes back to this kind of advice that just kind of gets recirculated. You know, whether it's like bring an agenda or whether it's like, you know, this or that and yeah, people still aren't tapping into just like what it takes to make people thrive. Right. Right. And some of it's and then so it's so simple. Often so simple. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like when I read the the first study I read of his that basically was like conversational turn taking is more important than anything else. I was just like, what? No, that cannot possibly be. And then, of course, because he's the primary researcher, there was real data there to bear that out. And it just like, how simple is that? It's just like for a leader, just like shut up mm-hmm. and let someone else have a go. That that's the magic wand. What? That's amazing. Yeah, no doubt. It's like as simple as, you know, there's so many simple tools as facilitators that I think if more leaders were to pick up some of these things, it would just make for a much better world. Absolutely. I want to hear what some of your top top tools are in the facilitation well, toolkit. How about this one? You just mentioned the turn taking. So just think about the word wait when you're holding a meeting. And it stands for why am I talking? <laughs> so good. And, and just like, <laughs> just keep that with you, you know, just like hold it close. <sighs> because yeah. Oftentimes, we just need to give space. And and this is especially important when we're talking about cross-cultural stuff because different cultures have different amounts of time that they need to respect others' spaces. Or, you know, some folks are more quick to jump in versus others. And that's that will vary drastically by culture. And so really making sure that people just have the time to process and then be ready to, to share. I love that. Why am I talking? I've never heard that before. It's so good. It's it's powerful one. Now, I want to come back to something we were talking about in the pre-show chat, which is like, I'm really excited to hear about this. You're talking about you're just done with meeting people where they're at. And <laughs> you've kind of come to these terms, which is probably hyperbole, because I'm sure that like there's plenty of stuff that you're like, you know, it's important to to be there for, for people. And, but the point is, there's some non-negotiable things that that are kind of table stakes to do this work. And so I'm curious, what have you found that if companies aren't doing these things or if leaders aren't tuned in, then it's going to be doomed out of the gate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a few things that we're just becoming more insistent about in terms of foundational agreements. And when we think about foundational agreements, think about it's like, you know, a company hires you and they're like, okay, we're going to play a game together. And it's like, we want you to change the game for us, but do it playing by our rules. 
Like that just doesn't work very well. And so when I talk about foundational agreements, it's like things like if you're not going to let me have an ability to facilitate or change the way you meet, I'm not interested. If you are not going to change the way that you change, like if you don't believe in participatory change and you're not going to embrace a structure for doing that, not interested. If you are so wedded to the tools that you have already, you know, I'm thinking particularly about tools that silo information and and sort of promote secrecy. I'm not really interested. And it's like, I'm not, you know, I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm not sponsored by a tool by Atlassian. Like I'm not, you know, I, I'm not particularly particular about the tool, but I am about the principles under the tool. And so if you're going to say to me, like, you know, we're just going to pass Word documents back and forth till we get to V73 in email and save it on my <laughs> desktop. I'm like, that's a problem for me in 2022. And that's not a rule of the game that I'm trying to play with you. Now, there are other things like, am I going to go through your nonsense procurement process with your lawyers who want to redline the MSA for their 30th time? Of course I am. Because like, there are certain things that we have to do to even get the board game laid out on the table and the pieces set up. But there, but those those foundational things around meetings, around tooling, around decision making have become pretty non-negotiable to me. And the great thing about working the way that we work at the Ready is that it's a talent marketplace at the Ready. And so what that looks like is if you're a client who comes in the door and is like, I'm going to give you this this tiny, tiny slice of domain to play in. And there's someone at the ready who's very interested in that because of the mission of that org or a personal connection or a a bigger play that I don't see. They are welcome to pursue that work if if that makes a lot of sense to them strategically. My boundaries are from my own experience and that I am at a point in my career where I would rather not do work than do work that I don't think is amazing. But what you're describing there, just even in that final little moment point that you made, is I think a great example of living the values of what you mm. what you what y'all preach, right? The fact that you can approach the work in a certain way, and this other individual can approach the work in a, in a certain way, and projects can come in in different sizes, and you can support different shapes and and configurations because. People can bring themselves, and and they do have the autonomy to manage those decisions. That speaks to the principles that you're living, I think. Thanks. I, I mean, that's how it feels to me. It feels like there's a lot of choice baked into our operating system, and I think that's how it should be. You know, we've all been in and around large consultancies where it's like, here's where you're deploying and if you if your utilization isn't what it should be there are consequences and like i truly cannot imagine being in a consultancy that runs that way and and the clients getting the best outcomes that just mm. that seems nuts to me yeah you know the other thing that strikes me too is that i sympathize with the companies that have been around longer and are more entrenched because i i feel that if to be mission driven to be values-based, and to support this very open and very kind of self-managed approach, recruiting intentionally towards that goal is a powerful strategy. Mm. (laughs) Because if you were kind of recruiting with the old mentality in mind, you might be putting people in boxes, and they might be very well suited to be in a box. And then in the new model... And you're asking them to like now behave in a, in a totally different way. The new system might not be the best environment for them. Not that that system wouldn't be good for them under a different mission or a different industry or a different company. Or even I've seen that in some of the candidates we interview for, and it's one of the reasons why we do very um, participatory interview style. So I think of a way to simulate the kind of stuff we would be doing together and get in there and do it. Because even if they lack the experience, I want to know what their intuition's like. Mm-hmm. Like when we're actually simulating that conversation, what are you bringing to the table and how are we, how are we jamming and, and reacting to each other on the fly? 
And so I don't know, I'd be curious to to hear your thoughts on like how much the the recruiting process and even the people that have already been recruited impact the line of sight on how easy it is to make these shifts, especially for companies that are more entrenched in the old way. Yeah. It's a really interesting question. So just to sort of work backwards, I think that, um, you know, when you describe how you all do your interviewing process, it, it's probably quite similar to how we do it at the ready. And what we're trying to do is give people a lived experience of what working with us is going to be like. So we deploy in duos. So interviews are in duos. We do certain kinds of practices. So interviews are those kinds of practices. We work with clients. So there's a client simulation. So it's like we are try- we're trying to just put people in the experience that is as close to the experience as they'll have so that they know if they like it. Because <laughs> like mm. It's not for everyone. So I think that's totally a feature and like really solid design unless that is being created in an aspirational way. So we're trying to simulate something that we're hoping happens. We're trying to simulate the future organization that we wish we would have, because then you're just lying to the candidate and you're giving them an experience that is not going to be fulfilled once they get there. So I think, I think this is an Aaronism, but like, I'm a big fan of start the way you mean to go. So like start, you know, have the interview process be reflective of the culture that someone is going to be onboarded into. In terms, though, of just like how does new blood sort of nest with making a shift, I think it can be incredibly beneficial if there is a protected domain where those new people with fresh ideas can experiment without retribution or immediately being squashed. Because like how many times have you seen the play in a traditional organization where they're like, we're going to hire Jeff and he's like a real revolutionary thinker and he's going to come shake things up and we're going to make him the head of innovation and we're going to give him $3 million to build an innovation lab. And like, is Jeff ever there 18 months later? No, he is not there because on his third day, they're like, Jeff, could we see um, a Gantt chart from you that outlines when you'll have amazing ideas that revolutionize our category? And also those need to be intra quarter because we have a stock price to uphold. It's like, you got to have enough domain where the person that you're bringing in who's different than the culture can actually do something and like have enough time and runway to make a bit of a dent that then can be a model or can spread beyond a small domain. There's also a big risk of even just telling that story. I mean, how how antithetical to self-managing is it to bring in someone and hang all our hopes and dreams glorify and idolize them as to solve all the problems like there no one else in the everyone's like well they'll figure it out what do i need to do exactly i mean i always say heroic leadership and that being necessary is the surest sign of crap org design like if you need that person to your exact point if you're hanging all your hopes on jeff you already have a deeply screwed up os i mean jeff is the worst Poor Jeff. I mean, that guy is just, he's not going to make it. <laughs> and the other thing I, that, that's funny about innovation programs like that is that there's generally a superficial investment. And mm. I call it the hipster barista. So, like, you've got, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the classic example, one of our clients, you know, <laughs> like, their offices feel like, you know, the, you know, former Soviet bloc, like, Uh, You know, it's like cosmonaut training or I don't know, it's like bad and no windows and and you're kind of going up through this just mauve like staircases and stuff. And then you get to like the sixth floor and opens up and it's like, oh, there's bananas in a basket and there's like and there's (laughs) cappuccinos and like and it looks like a WeWork or something. And and then but every other floor is just gross and bad and. And I'm like, wow, they actually, they gave the, they painted this floor up and made it all nice and put nice snacks, but only for the folks on this innovation floor. And so it sends this weird signal that only for them. And then also they're not really investing in innovation. It was just some kind of like lipstick on a pig kind of thing. And so it's all around is bad, 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 because it's like bad design. Yeah. It sends a really bad signal that we're actually investing, but then we're not. And it's just, it's like crazy broken. It's such a it's such a poignant example. And I think you see the same thing with DEI programs. You see the same thing with 
like learning and development programs where it's like, we're going to do this thing that is really core to our work and our identity, but we're not going to do it inside of our real work and identity. We're going to do it over there. Like we're going to do it in this other place where we send people away to learn or we put them on the fancy floor where there's kombucha. And then we're going to hope that by osmosis or like God knows what, that somehow permeates and changes the rest of our culture. And I'm just like, anytime you're talking about the committee forming or the tiger team or the separate floor or the field, like you've already lost the plot because it's not going to feel integrated into people's experience of work. Yeah. That's the thing that uh, L and D programs suffer from a ton, right? Like let's go off and learn a thing and then no one can ever integrate it into what they're doing that, they, it's like, how do I even apply it to my work? I've even forgotten whatever it was that they said. It was cool, but I've forgotten it. Exactly. Exactly. And and if I were to come home from my, you know, learning retreat and try to do something based on what I'd learned, how quickly would the system around me squash that? That's right. The likelihood is high that it would. If it if it was something that was gonna materially impact ways of working. The road is like adorned with <laughs> with these failures, right? And so what have you found? Of course, I would say the anecdote to that is bringing it internal to the work. So folks are actually hands-on applying these things. Are there any tactics or first steps that, that you could recommend for listeners to, to start thinking in those ways? Or, or even what is the first step towards that? Yeah. A thing I hear a lot from prospective clients is like, we have this big thing we need to do. And once we've done that, we'll learn new ways of working. And for anybody out there who meditates, I'm not a great meditator, but I like this as a metaphor. Um, You know, there are schools of meditation where you use distraction as the object on which you meditate. So like the sound of the bird becomes the object rather than something you're trying to push away. And that's kind of how I think about doing transformation work. So um, I'm talking to an organization right now that's like sort of a federation of a bunch of smaller organizations. And each one sort of has its own thing that it's up to. So like one got a grant that they need to spend. One has a new strategy that they want to implement. One is trying to pick a new leader. One, you know, all different kinds of, they're not even problems. They're just things that need to be done. And this organization, I think quite wisely, is like, can you teach us new ways of working while we do this thing that we have to do anyway? And I'm like, yes. So for this group who feels like there's something missing in terms of strategic clarity, we will facilitate them and teach them a way of developing strategy that becomes theirs. I don't care at all what the strategy is. I just want them to learn a new way of creating a strategy that's participatory, that can be steered continuously, that makes hard trade-offs, that's very clear and explicit, et cetera. Same with hiring. Rather than waiting for the new leader who's going to solve the problem, I'm like, can I? Can we teach you ways of designing a hiring process that will serve you forever. So it's like, give me the thing and learn the new way of working around the thing rather than learning new ways of working somewhere else and hoping that these things that are actually really core and critical to the business somehow get done well. That's 100%. I love it. And, you know, it's like, how do they immediately apply it? It's like, (laughs) I remember years ago, I was at a conference back when I was writing software and it was it was some sort of some software conference and this guy was talking about um you know training engineers and he was doing an eval at the end of the sessions and was asked to come do a talk on how he did the eval and it was basically like a time horizon on how immediate that they could apply the learnings and it was like i can immediately apply this now like I know that mm. something, whatever I learned today, I can go like literally go insert it into some software that I'm working on right now. Or it's like next week or next month or I don't know, maybe next quarter. I don't even know when, you know, these it's kind of a Likert scale that was based on how far out into the future. So <laughs> the thing that struck me was like, well, 
why didn't we assess from the get-go if this is going to be applicable for folks right now? <laughs> and why didn't we why didn't we talk about something that was relevant right now? And why didn't we talk about the concerns about how it's going to be applied and then maybe even create a mastermind around what what we're struggling with and and support each other through this change because otherwise everyone's kind of left on their own to kind of figure it out with with very loose I don't know, loose support. Yeah, totally. And it's also just like not how I think human beings always think. And I the the example that's coming to mind for me, so I'm working right now with a cross-functional group in a big organization that is about the future of work. They're like supposed to figure out, you know, figure out the future of work for this company. Very cool group of people, very smart, very cool culture at this company. And so I'm facilitating them in new meeting structures. We're using new tools. We're using new ways of making decisions, of chartering, of clarifying, et cetera. And we like got to a point a couple of weeks ago where there was not not even grumbling, but they were just like, this, this has been really cool. But like, you know, what are we actually going to do? And I'm like, all the things that we've been doing you can just do and those are real moves like just go just go do them and you'll be you'll be doing it it's like it's just the moment of being like you guys this is it we're doing it right now and it was it was really like a switch flipped and all of a sudden that you know there was a lot of pull for oh can i have an asset to help me with or here's a group that i think could use this process or i'm going to go facilitate this or i'm going to offer this or i'm going to suggest we do a retro whatever the things were but um but sometimes i think it takes if you're not an org designer or you're, or a coach or someone who sweats this stuff naturally, I think it's really easy to go back to your like QBR meeting and just be like, okie dokie, let's project the spreadsheet and listen to someone talk for 75 minutes. And it's like, no, no, you guys do the thing we just did, did an hour ago to understand and integrate feedback to something. Just, just do it over there, you know? So it's like, that's just a, it's a tricky shift to make. And then once people make it, they're like on fire. Yeah, the, they just... It's like trying it once, you know, and getting building that the, building that muscle memory of just being like, oh, I can do this. Exactly. Exactly. And I should. I should do this. Like, yes, <laughs> this, you know, they, for all the people who I have experiences with who are like, that was amazing. That was the best hour I've spent this week. I'm like, cool. Just go replicate this in the next thing you have to do. You You don't need me to do it. That's the whole idea. That's the thing, you know, I, I feel like habits are so hard to break. Like, even though people like feel like meetings are the worst and they complain and complain, but the reminder and outlook goes off and they go in there and they just default to, I mean, default's a good word, right? They just default yeah. to that behavior. And, yeah. they, and it takes some energy to like knock folks out of that default. And I think what you're talking around about, like the coach can go a long way towards nudging and encouraging folks to just make that first step. The other thing I've noticed too, I don't know if you've tried this, but we do a lot of what my friend Keith McCandless refers to as thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we might be running a thing, but then it's like that metacognition moment where you're like, so what just happened was, or like what I'm doing right here is, you know, so it's like, not yes. only are we modeling a thing, but then we're also being like, Hey, by the way, you can do this in your weekly, you know? Yeah. I love that. I've started at the end of, you know, a half day at, at sort of the half day break and the end of day break of workshops, just recapping the practices that we used. And people are like, wow, we did. So we tried so many things. But it, but I've noted like to 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 your and Keith's point, um, when you don't do that, people just go like, wow, that was a dope workshop. Not like here's 10 things we did that you could just go do. Here's the thing. If you've designed a really amazing experience where there's a great arc, people get lost in it because it's like engaging. There's a through line. Exactly. It's like being on a roller coaster. No one, no one, no one ends a roller coaster and thinks there was, okay, there were three ups, four downs, two loops. You know, maybe they remember vague feelings, the high and low points, you know, the power of memory moments. But like, so yeah, giving them that manual, I think is important. Totally. Totally. What about commitments? You know, like, uh, I think ending with like encouraging them to think about when they might apply it and then share that commitment. So it's like they're making it to themselves and maybe to someone else also can serve as that little nudge too. 
Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of, um, we love the closing round of a meeting or a session that's like a personal flip. And we especially love to do it in writing in a board nice. because oh, yeah. just sort of seeing everyone's own personal commitment. I think it totally does what you're saying in terms of nudging. And I also think it reinforces the shared ownership of making change because you're not saying what will we commit to or what should we do differently next time? It's like from the experience that we just had, here's what I am signing up for. And those little, you know, those little pebbles in the pond can make a really big tidal wave over time. Oh, 100 percent. If everyone's doing their little piece. Wow. You know, that's yeah. that's how mountains get moved. Exactly. It makes me think of like a beehive, you know, they're all doing their little pieces and, you know, amazing things happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm curious, do you all look to like we we look to nature a lot um, because complexity for inspiration around systems thinking. Do you find that you do the same? Like, I think beehive is such a good example. Yeah. I, you know, I think that um, one of my favorite examples actually comes from team of teams, if I'm remembering correctly. Sometimes I get lost in the stories and I forget where they even come from, but I'm pretty sure it came from Team of Teams where he was comparing leadership to being a gardener. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't force the you can't force the plants to grow. You can create the conditions and that and that's complexity theory one oh one, right? Like what are our what are our initial conditions we need to we need to establish so that things can spring forth? And I think right. that's uh you know, my wife's an avid gardener, and whenever I, I, I watch her gardening, and I often think about like, yeah, that's kind of what it's all about. You know, it's like let's like yeah. let's remove some impediments. Like these, we don't want these weeds in the way. And the beautiful thing about that is, if we're really thinking about leadership from that perspective, anybody can be a leader. It's Absolutely. not about some role or position. If I see a weed, I can remove it. If I see something in Rachel's way, I can get that out of the way. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's it's a it's a really beautiful metaphor. And that's how we should be looking not just at leadership, but at systems. You know, I often think about sort of the the governing of the commons and Ostrom's work. And, to you know, I think about I think about the ready, for example, like a garden. And it's like, is it only one or two people's role to, like, make sure that the plants don't die? It's not. It is a community garden. And if nobody tends to it it'll die. And so I think it's it's the right, more collective, more powerful, and ultimately less fragile way of looking at leadership than the old model of the brilliant strategist who could see eight moves ahead and then just tell all the pawns where to go. I love that. Especially the community garden piece. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Specifically comparing it to like everyone in the community has a vested interest in making it as awesome as it can be. And and you could, I think a dystopian view would be that, oh, people will just litter and take advantage or just like harvest from it or whatever. But you see them thrive quite um, magnanimously and it's like really nice. Yeah, you do. And it, what it, having worked in a lot of traditional systems, there was often, you know, there's often a tenor of comp- of competition and how that shows up is, is my part more valuable than your part? Like if I'm the salesperson, is that more valuable than the product person? Or if I'm the finance person, is that more valuable than the marketing person? And in a garden, nobody cares which plant is the most important. It's like, you know, I think about this at the ready. I think one of the things I'm really proud of in terms of our own maturation over the last couple of years is that there is an appreciation that it takes a lot of different kinds of effort and different kinds of ingredients to have a garden emerge that is vibrant and healthy. And so there's no debate or discussion of like, is finance more important than growth or should hiring get more than the, it's like, we need it all. We need all of it in order to have a, a really thriving community that feeds us. Yeah. I think ecological models are really fascinating. We actually, and we have a weekly facilitation lab where we invite facilitators to come and just experiment with stuff that they haven't tried before so that uh, we can learn and, you know, we're not necessarily doing it in front of a client or not doing it in front of the big boss or whatever. So we had an ecologist come and she was experimenting with some ecology models as a form of facilitating the groups. And I was like, this is like 
kind of new and interesting, but it feels That's very cool. familiar and, and similar. So it was like, it was almost just like new language over top of something yeah. that was already very familiar. It's fascinating. I love that. That's really cool. So, you know, I think we could clearly geek out and talk about this stuff for, <laughs> for, for a long, long time, but uh, we're going to have to come to a close. And so I guess would like to wrap with a couple things. First, as you think about the potential, as more and more companies, you know, lean into these things. And, you know, in the pre-show chat, we mentioned Web3. We didn't get to it in this conversation, but certainly, you know, that's a place that this this stuff could go or even that might unlock more potential. Like when when companies embrace this stuff more, whether it's through Web3 or other mechanisms, what do you think becomes possible? What does the world look like once this once we see more of this? Uh, I mean, what's not possible? I I feel like the more I see systems really leading into self-management, whether that is DAOs in Web3 or whether it's, you know, cities that want to become self-managed in terms of local government or whether that is community organizing that takes a very self-managed approach. I'm just like participation from the invested who are also impacted by the outcomes will save us from broken systems. And I look around in in the U.S. at least at the systems that we pay into and work in and uphold that don't serve the people inside of them, whether you're talking about education or healthcare or aspects of the government. And what that falls to, to hearken back to our earlier conversation, is we expect heroism from healthcare workers, from teachers, from politicians to overcome a broken system and serve us. And to me, that is not reasonable. It's not sustainable. And my hope for the future is that we can build different kinds of systems so that we don't have to live in the ones that suck and try incrementally to reform them from within. Well said, well said. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to leave our listeners with a final thought. So what should they keep in mind as we kind of close out the episode here? Oh, gosh, this has been really fun. I guess because this is on my mind right now, a thing that I would leave people with is as you are inspired to go and make change and make haste in the world, do your own work. I'm in a coaching process right now with the Conscious Leadership Group, who I think a lot of. And uh, I am a coach. I've had coaches. You know, I'm like very bought into self-work. And what I'm being reminded of being re-engaged in that process is if you want to be someone who is a catalyst in the world for making change, like get your own shop in order first and know know how you are, how you're seen, what you're about, what your aim is, et cetera, et cetera. And, and not as a precursor, but at least in parallel to trying to shift other things, shift yourself. All right. Thank you, Rodney. So great to chat with you today, and I hope we can talk again soon. Thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog, where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com.